going to hear from your lawyers, and that means zip it. But you're not letting me tell that you means what's going on. Zip it right now. You trying to Does that make sense? No, it doesn't. Franklin Williams. First, we delve into the jaw-dropping case of Franklin Williams, a man whose courtroom sentencing took a dramatic turn. In the small town of Cleveland, Ohio, a series of shocking crimes unfolded, leaving the community in disbelief. At the center of it all was Franklin Williams, a man whose actions would forever change the lives of those involved. It all began with a string of armed robberies that terrorized the town. Franklin, known for his cunning and audacity, targeted various establishments, leaving no stone unturned. From convenience stores to banks, he struck fear into the heart of innocent bystanders, but Franklin's criminal activities didn't stop there. As the investigation deepened, it was revealed that he was also involved in a vast drug trafficking network. His connections reached far and wide, making him a formidable force in the criminal underworld. The charges against Franklin were numerous and severe. He faced counts of armed robbery, drug trafficking, and conspiracy to commit heinous crimes. The evidence against him was overwhelming, leaving little room for doubt. As the trial began, the courtroom was filled with anticipation. The prosecution presented a compelling case meticulously laying out the evidence against Franklin. Witnesses took the stand, recounting their terrifying encounters with the defendant. The jury listened intently, fully aware of the gravity of the charges. Throughout the trial, Franklin maintained a stoic demeanor, seemingly unfazed by the mounting evidence against him. His defense team, however, fought tooth and nail to cast doubt on the prosecution's case. They argued that Franklin was merely a pawn in a larger criminal enterprise, manipulated by more powerful individuals. But the prosecution was relentless, presenting air airtight evidence that linked Franklin directly to the crimes. Surveillance footage, eyewitness testimonies, and intercepted communications painted a damning picture of his involvement. The drama and commotion in the courtroom were palpable. Emotions ran high as the victims bravely shared their harrowing experiences, their voices trembling with fear and anger. The families of the victims, desperate for justice, watched with bated breath, hoping for closure. As the trial reached its climax, the judge delivered a scathing indictment of Franklin's actions. The severity of his crimes could not be ignored, and the judge made it clear that he would face the full weight of the law. Finally, the jury reached a verdict. Franklin Williams was found guilty on all charges. The courtroom erupted in a mix of relief and disbelief. The victims and their families found solace in the fact that justice had been served, but the story doesn't end there. The courtroom drama took an unexpected turn when the judge, in an unprecedented move, ordered Franklin's mouth to be taped shut during the sentencing. I'm going to hear from your lawyers, and that means zip it. But you're not letting me tell that you means what's going on. zip it right now. You trying to Does that make sense? No, it doesn't. But Franklin didn't stop talking. In fact, he kept interrupting the judge, thus causing the judge to gag him. I'm gonna tape it, me on and then I'll unzip it when I want you to talk. This shocking act of control and punishment left everyone in the courtroom stunned. As news of the incident spread, media outlets across the nation picked up the story, thrusting Franklin Williams into the spotlight. The courtroom footage went viral, capturing the attention of millions and sparking a national conversation about the rights of defendants and the role of the justice system. The judge orders the court officials to legal experts weighed in on the matter, offering differing opinions on the judge's decision. Some argued that the extreme measure was necessary to maintain order and prevent further disruptions, while others condemned it as a violation of Franklin's rights and a breach of courtroom decorum. The judge, in response to the public outcry, defended his actions, stating that while the decision may have been unconventional, it was within his authority to ensure a fair and orderly trial. He cited legal precedent to support his position, emphasizing that the primary goal was to uphold the integrity of the judicial process. However, critics of the judge's decision pointed out that there are alternative methods to maintain decorum in the courtroom without resorting to such extreme measures. They argued that the incident undermined the principles of fairness and impartiality that are the foundation of the justice system. In the aftermath of the controversial sentencing, Franklin Williams's case became a rallying point for activists and advocates who sought to shed light on the flaws within the criminal justice system. They argued that the incident highlighted the need for reforms to ensure that defendants are treated with dignity and respect, regardless of the severity of their crimes. As the dust settled, Franklin Williams began serving his sentence, a staggering 33 years behind bars. The severity of the punishment reflected the gravity of his crimes and the court's determination to send a strong message to would-be offenders. While the controversy surrounding the taping incident eventually subsided, the case of Franklin Williams continues to serve as a reminder of the complexities and challenges inherent in the criminal justice system. It raises important questions about the balance between maintaining order in the courtroom and safeguarding defendants' rights. 
C.L. Angelo. In a shocking and dramatic incident that unfolded inside a Utah federal courthouse, C.L. Angelo, a member of the Tongan Crip Gang, met a tragic end when he was shot by a U.S. Marshal. Now, let's delve into the heart-stopping incident that took place inside a Utah federal courthouse, where C.L. Angelo, a member of the notorious Tongan Crip Gang, met a tragic end. C.L. Angelo, a 25-year-old member of the notorious Tongan Crip Gang, had a reputation for violence that preceded him. Born and raised in a world where loyalty to the gang was paramount, Angelao found himself entangled in a web of criminal activities from an early age. In 2010, Angelao was named as one of 17 individuals in a gang-related indictment that accused Tongan Crip members of assault, conspiracy, robbery, and weapons offenses. The charges painted a grim picture of a criminal enterprise that thrived on violence and intimidation. The indictment alleged that Angelao and his fellow gang members had engaged in a series of assaults, targeting rival gangs and innocent victims alike. Their criminal activities extended to conspiracy, with the gang members allegedly plotting and executing robberies to further their illicit gains. The weapons offenses listed in the indictment highlighted the dangerous nature of the Tongan Crip Gang. Armed with firearms, the gang members posed a significant threat to the safety and well-being of the communities they operated in. As the trial unfolded, Angelao found himself as the last defendant standing, the final piece in the puzzle of justice seeking to hold the Tongan Crip Gang accountable for their crimes. Previous defendants had already been sentenced to lengthy prison terms, ranging from 10 to 30 years. The courtroom drama surrounding Angelao's trial was heightened by the decision to present him as an unshackled defendant. In an effort to ensure a fair trial, Angelao had assured the judge that he would behave, requesting to appear in civilian clothes rather than handcuffs. This decision aimed to present him as an individual entitled to the presumption of innocence despite his alleged involvement in heinous crimes. The trial itself was a high-stakes affair, with the jury tasked with determining Angelao's guilt or innocence. The prosecution presented a compelling case, supported by evidence and witness testimonies that painted a vivid picture of the gang's criminal activities. It was a seemingly ordinary day in the courtroom as the gang-related racketeering trial of C.L. Angelao was underway. Angelao, a 25-year-old with a reputation for violence, sat calmly beside his attorney, his demeanor giving no indication of the chaos that was about to ensue. As the witness testimony continued, tension filled the air. Suddenly, Angelao rose from his seat, his eyes fixed on the witness stand. In a swift and calculated move, he reached over and snatched his lawyer's pen, gripping it tightly in his hand. The courtroom erupted in gasps and murmurs as those present sensed that something was about to go terribly wrong. Amidst the commotion, a voice cried out, Whoa, whoa, whoa! But it was too late. Angelao sprinted towards the witness stand, his right arm cocked overhead, the pen poised to strike. Panic ensued as everyone realized the imminent danger that loomed before them. The intended victim, a shackled witness, reacted with lightning speed, jumping back just in the nick of time. Angelao's attempt to strike was thwarted, but the chaos had only just begun. In a desperate bid to evade capture, Angelao lost his balance and fell feet first over the front of the witness stand, his body hurtling towards the ground. In the midst of this chaotic scene, an unidentified U.S. Marshal, positioned strategically in the courtroom, made a split-second decision that would change the course of events. With Angelao's life hanging in the balance, the Marshal drew their weapon and fired four shots at close range. The sound of gunshots reverberated through the courtroom, sending shockwaves through the hearts of those present. A woman's horrified cry pierced the air while law enforcement officials in suits rushed towards the witness stand, their instincts kicking in to restore order. Amidst the chaos, Angelao's defense attorney sought refuge under a nearby desk, seeking safety from the unfolding mayhem. Prosecutors, stunned by the sudden turn of events, stood frozen in disbelief, their minds struggling to comprehend the gravity of the situation. As the smoke cleared and the echoes of the gunshots subsided, a bailiff sprang into action, swiftly moving to block the entrance to the front of the courtroom. With his right hand firmly on his holstered weapon, he pointed at individuals in the gallery, instructing them to remain still, ensuring the safety of all those present. The tension in the room was palpable as an officer standing over Angelao yelled at him to drop the pen, urging him to comply with their commands. As U.S. District Judge Tina Campbell was escorted out of the courtroom, someone in the vicinity made a frantic call to 911, seeking immediate assistance. The urgency in their voice reflected the severity of the situation and the need for swift action. Outside the courtroom, the scene was no less chaotic. Law enforcement personnel flooded the area responding to the distress call. The courthouse, once a symbol of justice and order, now stood as a testament to the unpredictability and danger that can lurk within its walls. In the aftermath of the shooting, questions began to arise regarding the actions of the U.S. Marshal involved. The unidentified Marshal was swiftly cleared of any wrongdoing, with Lindsay Donahue, a spokeswoman for the Marshal's service, stating that the video footage demonstrated how 
quickly violence can erupt in any situation. The FBI's investigation concluded that the officer's use of force was within agency policy, and a review board supported this finding. I think there's no question, though. You can turn a pen into a knife or its equivalent. You can take someone's life with it. However, controversy surrounded the incident, with the Angelou family's attorney, Bob Skies, offering a contradictory viewpoint. Skies argued that the marshal had panicked and should have employed alternative methods to subdue Angelou. He pointed out that Angelou was already on the ground when the final three shots were fired, questioning the necessity of using deadly force. The Angelou family's wrongful death lawsuit was subsequently dismissed by U.S. District Judge John Dowdle, who cited the video evidence as proof that the U.S. Marshal had acted reasonably. Dowdell's ruling emphasized that the Marshal's use of force was objectively reasonable under the totality of the U.S. circumstances. It's easy if you slow down the video to maybe argue or suggest that there was enough time to do something different. When you watch it live, it's very hard to see that anything different could have occurred. The controversy surrounding the incident has left many divided, with some questioning the limits of police use of force and the need for alternative methods of subduing a suspect. The Angelou family still grappling with the loss of their loved one has yet to decide whether they will appeal the ruling. Next, we delve into the shocking case of Sidney Newsom, a man whose courtroom appearance took an unexpected turn. In Pike County Justice Court, Mississippi, what started as a routine domestic violence charge quickly escalated into a violent outburst that left everyone in disbelief. As I delve deeper into the shocking courtroom attack involving Sidney Newsom, it's important to understand the background of the man at the center of this incident. Sidney Newsom, a 27-year-old individual, found himself in Pike County Justice Court facing a domestic violence charge. While the exact details of the charge are not disclosed, it is clear that the situation took a dramatic turn. Prior to the incident, Newsom appeared relatively calm, reviewing paperwork and even engaging in a lighthearted dance. However, as events unfolded, it became evident that there was a deeper turmoil within him. This background sets the stage for the unexpected and violent outburst that would soon unfold in the courtroom. The tension in the courtroom reached its peak when Sidney Newsom's frustration and anger erupted into a violent altercation with Judge Aubrey Rimes. As the transport officer tapped on the table, attempting to maintain order, Newsom's agitation grew apparent. Despite the officer's efforts to guide him, Newsom's defiance became evident as he argued with Judge Rimes, refusing to leave the courtroom. In a shocking display of aggression, Newsom grabbed a sack of papers from the desk and hurled them at the judge, causing chaos as papers flew in every direction. The commotion escalated further when Newsom seized a telephone and launched it at Judge Rimes, toppling a computer monitor in the process. It was at this moment that Judge Rimes, determined to regained control, took matters into his own hands. With remarkable strength and authority, he single-handedly pinned Newsom onto the desk, bringing a temporary halt to the chaos. The unexpected altercation between Sidney Newsom and Judge Aubrey Rimes left everyone in the courtroom stunned and served as a stark reminder of the unpredictable nature of legal proceedings. Amidst the chaos of the courtroom altercation, Newsom's family members, his mother and brother, entered the scene, adding another layer of drama to the already intense situation. As Newsom briefly stepped towards them, the transport officer motioned him back in line, attempting to restore order. However, the presence of his family seemed to further fuel Newsom's defiance. While it remains unclear whether his brother's intentions were to assist the judge or exacerbate the situation, he also got involved in the altercation. As the courtroom descended into chaos, the intervention of transport officials became crucial in restoring order and removing Sidney Newsom from the premises. In response to the escalating situation, four additional transport officials swiftly streamed into the courtroom, providing much-needed back up. Working together, they attempted to regain control over Newsom, who continued to resist their efforts. Eventually, after a struggle, one of the transport officials managed to lead Newsom out of the room, bringing an end to the violent episode. The removal of Newsom from the courtroom marked a turning point, allowing the proceedings to resume and the chaos to subside. The intervention of the transport officials played a crucial role in restoring order and ensuring the safety of all individuals present in the courtroom. In the aftermath of the shocking courtroom altercation, the repercussions for Sydney Newsom were swift and severe. Newsom faced an additional charge of contempt of court, adding to the gravity of his actions. This charge highlighted the serious disregard he displayed towards the authority of the court and the disruption he caused during the proceedings. As a consequence, Newsom was sentenced to serve 48 hours in jail, a punishment that reflected the severity of his behavior. The courtroom altercation left a lasting impact on all those involved, serving as a stark reminder of the potential dangers that can arise within the legal system. The incident prompted authorities to review 
review and implement enhanced security procedures to prevent similar incidents from occurring in the future. The aftermath of the courtroom altercation underscored the importance of maintaining order and respect within the justice system. Next, we delve into the chilling case of Tristan Lamoureux, a man who made headlines for the unthinkable act of murdering his wife. In the quiet town of Cedar City, Utah, a seemingly ordinary couple, Tristan Lamoureux and his wife Misty, lived a life that would soon be shattered by tragedy. The events that unfolded leading up to Tristan Lamoureux's guilty plea for the murder of his wife were nothing short of shocking. It all began on a fateful day when an argument between Tristan and Misty escalated to a level no one could have anticipated. The tension in their apartment reached a boiling point, and in a fit of rage, Tristan committed an act that would forever change their lives. According to news reports, Misty was shot five times in the head, a horrifying and brutal act of violence. The details of the crime sent shockwaves through the community, leaving friends, family, and neighbors in disbelief. When the police arrived at the scene, they discovered Misty's lifeless body in the bathroom, a chilling sight that would haunt them forever. Meanwhile, Tristan attempted to flee the scene, but his escape was short-lived. Law enforcement swiftly apprehended him, ensuring that he would face justice for his heinous actions. The authorities wasted no time in bringing him to trial, where the full extent of his crime would be revealed. The courtroom, located in the 5th District Court in Cedar City, became the stage for the dramatic proceedings. Tristan Lamoureux, now surrounded by four sheriff's deputies, sat in the defendant's chair, a constant reminder of the gravity of his actions. The atmosphere was tense as the judge, G. Michael Westfall, presided over the case, ensuring that justice would be served. As the trial progressed, Misty's brother, Jason Wilson, was called upon to deliver an impact statement. Statement. Wilson approached the podium with a mix of grief and anger etched on his face. His eyes locked onto Tristan, a man he once considered family, but now saw as a monster. The intensity in the courtroom was palpable. As Wilson began to speak, his words filled with raw emotion. With a trembling voice, Wilson began his impact statement, recounting the cherished memories he shared with Misty. He spoke of their childhood adventures, their unbreakable bond, and the dreams they had for their futures. The courtroom listened intently, captivated by Wilson's heartfelt words. But as Wilson Wilson continued, his tone shifted from nostalgia to anger. He unleashed a torrent of emotions, directing his words directly at Tristan. He described the pain and devastation that had consumed their family since Misty's untimely death. Wilson's voice quivered with a mix of sorrow and rage as he demanded answers from the man who had taken his sister's life. Tristan, seemingly unaffected, continued to rock back and forth in his chair, his face devoid of any visible emotion. Wilson's words seemed to fall on deaf ears, further fueling his frustration. Determined to break through Tristan's Tristan's indifference, Wilson took a step closer to the defendant, his voice growing louder and more forceful. The tension in the courtroom escalated as Wilson's anger reached its peak. He pleaded with Tristan to acknowledge the pain he had caused to show remorse for his actions. But Tristan remained stoic, his eyes fixed on a distant point, seemingly detached from the reality of the situation. Frustrated by Tristan's lack of response, Wilson's desperation grew. In a moment of sheer anguish, he lunged at Tristan, his grief and anger overpowering his rationality. The courtroom erupted into chaos as sheriff's deputies swiftly intervened. The scene was chaotic, with chairs spinning and voices raised in a cacophony of emotions. Tristan, now standing, appeared ready to engage in a physical altercation. But before he could make a move, a deputy forcefully slammed him to the ground, effectively subduing him. The courtroom fell into stunned silence as the deputies worked to restrain Wilson and restore order. The judge, recognizing the pain Wilson had endured, ordered his removal from the courtroom. With Wilson's departure, the deputies diligently worked to restore order, ensuring that the trial could proceed. Tristan Lamoureux, seemingly unfazed by the dramatic events that had just unfolded, resumed his nonchalant rocking in his chair. The courtroom, now engulfed in a heavy silence, awaited the next phase of the trial. The impact statement delivered by Jason Wilson had left an indelible mark on the courtroom. As the recess came to an end, the judge returned to the bench, ready to proceed with the trial. The deputies ensured that Tristan Lamoureux was securely restrained, their watchful eyes never leaving him. The courtroom, now filled with a sense of anticipation, awaited the next next phase of the proceedings. The prosecution presented a compelling case, meticulously laying out the evidence against Lamoureux. They called upon witnesses who had been present at the scene of the crime, providing chilling testimonies that painted a vivid picture of the tragic events that had unfolded in that apartment. Forensic experts took the stand, detailing the results of their investigations. They presented the jury with irrefutable evidence, including ballistics reports that matched the bullets found at the crime scene to the weapon in Lamoureux's possession. The weight of the evidence against him seemed insurmountable 
insurmountable. As the trial progressed, the defense had the opportunity to present their case. Lamoureux's lawyer, a seasoned attorney known for his ability to sway juries, sought to cast doubt on the prosecution's narrative. He questioned the reliability of the witnesses. The defense called upon experts of their own, attempting to create an alternative narrative that would cast Lamoureux in a more sympathetic light. They argued that the events leading up to the tragic incident were the result of a volatile relationship, suggesting that Misty's actions had provoked Lamoureux to act in self-defense. With the closing arguments concluded, the judge instructed the jury to deliberate and reach a verdict. The fate of Tristan Lamoureux now rested in their hands. The courtroom held its breath as the jury filed out, their decision carrying the weight of justice. Days turned into weeks as the jury deliberated, carefully considering the evidence and testimonies presented during the trial. The public anxiously awaited the verdict, their curiosity piqued by the shocking events that had unfolded in the courtroom. Guilty. Tristan Lamoureux was found guilty of first-degree murder, a verdict that sent shockwaves through the courtroom. The family of Misty, who had endured the pain and anguish of the trial, found solace in the knowledge that justice had been served. The courtroom, now filled with a mix of relief and sorrow, witnessed the sentencing phase of the trial. The judge, after considering the severity of the crime and the impact it had on Misty's loved ones, handed down the sentence. Tristan Lamoureux was to serve 15 years to life in prison, a punishment that reflected the gravity of his actions. With the trial concluded and justice served, the courtroom slowly emptied, leaving behind a sense of closure mixed with lingering questions. The shocking events that had unfolded during the trial would forever be etched in the memories of those who had witnessed them. Thanks for watching. Click on the videos on your screen for similar content.